episode of Peace Talks. This is a series where we catch up with the bands and artists that are coming to play for us at the Mars Bar in Worcester. And uh, this week we've got Sam Leek, a keyboardist from uh, London. Hi, Sam. Thanks for joining us today. Hello. Thanks for having me. Uh, Sam will be bringing up his uh, band uh, Looking Glass on Thursday. That's Thursday the 18th of April. Um, Sam, you you, um, you came and played with us uh, previously. You were actually in uh, Francesco La Castro's band in May. So uh, it's it's your second visit to the Mars Bar. That's correct. May yeah. last year, yeah. So that was with uh, Rob Statham and our, our fairly fairly local drummer, Neil Bullock, which was fantastic. Yeah, that was a great, great night, that one. Yeah, um, that so this is, uh, this is your own project, uh, Looking Glass. Mm -hmm. Um, and I saw, I think it was probably, it was probably on Facebook or something that I saw that you'd, uh, you were playing a gig down at, um, uh, Oliver's down in Greenwich, I think it was, um, with Nick Clinic and Laurie Lowe, who we had up with, um, Yolanda Charles's Project PH in, uh, in February last year. Um, so I thought, oh, this is fantastic. And Flo Moore on bass as well. So it'll be for the three of you, for you, Nick and Laurie, uh, it'll be your second visit to the Mars Bar, um. You get you, you get um, a loyalty scheme, by the way. You know, <laughs> once, yeah. <laughs> once, once, once you played five times, you get you get an increase in your fees. <laughs> After five times, so I'm still. But like, it has to be a different lineup every time, different bands. <laughs> makes a decrease fast. Is that <laughs> so um, yeah, so yeah, tell us a, tell us a bit about that band then, because uh, that, that sounds really exciting. Uh, yeah, it's a great band. So it's one of uh, many projects I have. Um, it's not the not the only only band, but this is the one where I get to uh, explore some gnarly jazz fusions. We play loads of uh, Alan Holdsworth tunes and um, John McLaughlin tunes and things by uh, VJ Iyer uh, and Weather Report and various others. And it's it's a it's a shred. <laughs> it's uh, fantastic. It's um, great playing with those guys. Uh, Nick Lennick was a um, a really great find a few years back. Forgotten who recommended him. To... No, I remember now. It was um, Laurie. Uh, we had right. a bit of a uh, lineup change for various reasons um, a couple of years ago, um, and the lineup um, changed completely. Uh, and uh, it's the first time I'd ever played with Nick. Um, and I remember Laurie sending me a video of him and saying, "Oh, this guy would be great. See what you think." And it was, uh, yeah, terrifying. He's a he's a monster, isn't he? Um, so yeah, and uh, Flo's mega. I've known Flo for a very long time. Flo actually um, was taught music by my aunt in Aylesbury. Oh, there um, you go. <laughs> a little bit of family history. So she, uh, whenever I meet her, she tends to ask me how uh, how Auntie Sue is doing. Oh, is, fantastic! Uh, funny. Uh, yeah, Laurie, I played with on a number of projects over the years um, with Sean Khan, with Heidi Vogel, with all sorts. Um, he, as we all know, is a uh, monstrous drama so yeah should be should be a lot of fun yeah we had um david preston up um a, a couple of gigs ago yeah it was in february i think yeah um obviously with uh we played with uh, uh kevin glasgow and, and laurie and mm. EGL, preston preston glasgow low um right. yeah so it's good good that we're getting through uh getting through some of the best musicians that the uk has to offer so you're, you're based in london now right um is um, have you, have you, are you, are you sort of born and bred london are you yeah, I'm one of the uh, one of the few Londoners that's just born in London and stayed in London. Uh, maybe I'll have to change that at some point, move to America or something. Um, yeah, just I, I was brought up in uh, Ealing and then Twickenham, and now I live uh, on the other side of London in Charlton, which is kind of like the rough end of Greenwich. Oh, okay. <laughs> if if Greenwich has a rough end, there you go. And. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, so nice. what, what's, what's your sort of musical background then? Kind of how did you get into, into where you are now? Uh, uh, yeah, um, I used to be a guitarist, which is probably why I'm um, um, so impressed by the likes of uh, likes of Nick. Uh, I definitely can't play guitar like that. I do still play guitar for fun at home um, sometimes with the sound off. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's called air um, guitar, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, with the and and with no guitar. Uh, yeah, it's it's a great instrument. I really love it. As um, I'm hoping at some point to to maybe try and um, take it seriously. I've been getting better at it quietly and slowly. So maybe one of these days, who knows? Um, 
but uh, yeah, so I used to play like rock blues guitar um, and used to sing as well. So I'd go and I'd play in lots of uh, pubs and blues jams and blues mm. gigs and uh, doing my best Hendrix or Stevie Ray Vaughan impression. Um, and that was great. And then I had a rock band where I wrote all the songs for that. And um, that was really fun. At the same point, I was having classical piano lessons. Um, I had a really great teacher when I was younger called uh, Roger Perrin, who, who just kind of got me listening to lots of other music, got me checking out Oscar Peterson, got me listening to Weather Report, um, sort of funky Herbie Hancock, the sorts of things that I think he thought might appeal to me as someone who liked kind of rock and blues. Yeah. Um, he got me listening to those and I was doing this youth youth jazz band that he ran um, and eventually made the switch across, I guess. Um, I I did a classical music undergrad at um, King's College London, which um, I probably didn't make the most of because I was getting into jazz at the time uh, and the classes on the, the life and music of Wagner and Schumann and whatever. <laughs> didn't really interest me at the time. It interests me now. I wish I could go back and do it right. properly. But um, uh, some of the stuff was great. We learned how to write um, uh, fugues and to pastiche Brahms and stuff like that. That was really interesting. I loved those classes um, with a guy called Gareth Wilson. Um, I had uh, I had lessons with um, <laughs> a really famous classical composer. I've forgotten his name. Uh, Benjamin. Oh, he, he wrote Written on Skin. So George Benjamin. I guess. The, cool. He's far too famous in the classical world okay. of music. Completely forgotten him like that. Um, the classes with him were interesting. Uh, they weren't necessarily great. He he delivered a lot of them in French for some reason. Given he's not French, and given that I'm presuming most of the class didn't speak French, I didn't really know uh, <laughs> what, the, what the of that was. So I sort of his music is good. <laughs> it was either speaking in French or uh, telling us all about his uh, his lessons and various taxi chats with Messiaen. Um, uh, yeah, so it was an interesting experience. Um, I did a lot of stuff outside um, Kings when I was at Kings. So I did um, classes at SOAS. I learned how to, not very well, but I learned how to play uh, Batar drums and just sort of engage with some of okay. the music career, which was fun. Um, then I did my postgrad at the Royal Academy of Music in Jazz. I'd been quite involved in the Royal Academy of Music before. I came to do that. So I'd been having my piano classes arranged through there and I've been going to Pete Churchill's composition classes during my undergrad. Um, and so I was already kind of friends with a lot of the people there and playing with a lot of the people there by that point as well. Um, and then when there was a postgrad, had a great time, I had lessons with Gwilym Simcock for a couple of years, which was right, okay. really amazing. Um, had some lessons with John Taylor, mm -hmm. um, the lesson with Dan Tepfer that led to me recording a record with him a few years later, which was great. Um, so yeah, lots of good things happened there. And then uh, started life as a professional jazz musician, recorded an album fresh out of college called Aquarium, uh, with a band called Aquarium with James Allsop, Josh Blackmore and Callum Gourlay. Mm -hmm. uh, then a couple of years later, released another record. Both of those went pretty well at the time. That was probably my, my 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> and then I, I, I got a little, what would I say, Poss possibly a little disillusioned with the mechanics of the, of the, the jazz scene, not the musicians, not right, the music. Okay. So, I mean, I think we've got an amazing scene here and some amazing musicians here, more just some of the, um, the politics and the things that kind of hold you back and, the, um, the difficulties you know every every record you create after a while starts to feel a bit like a vanity project you wonder whether it's really worth putting the, uh, the money and the effort into this thing that three people and a dog will read and uh, will this will listen to sorry oh, yeah. and and so so i got a, a little a little um i'm making it sound grimmer than i really feel i'm not I'm not that negative <laughs> um but it but it, yeah it wasn't I, I sort of felt like there must be more to life than this mm -hmm. um and thinking about other things I was interested in and other stuff I wanted to do and I've sort of refashioned myself into a um <laughs> so I, uh, I had a um uh, I was on the front cover of the Musicians Union magazine a few years back um and there was a um article accompanying article on me in it and they described me as renaissance man which was okay um, which was kind of cool but because I do a number of different things 
Uh, but the best thing about that is I teach a Friday in a school and um, uh, this uh, this article was up on the wall in the not I didn't put it down. Right. <laughs> this article up on the up, up on the wall in the classroom, and so all the kids were seeing this article with the big picture of the piano teacher and it's saying Renaissance man. And I remember one day coming into the school and this kid looking up at me like I was a superhero and going, "Oh my God, it's Renaissance man!" <laughs> and it, it's hilarious. Um, Anyway, where am I going? I've gone on a, one of my several detours. Uh, so I do lots of things. So, I, so I, um, I, I've done a PhD in psychology. Um, uh, I've got interests in um, new, uh, linguistics, neuroscience. I've been learning how to code in a few different languages. Um, I teach in a university and I teach a variety of things there. So I teach, um, obviously teach um, improvisation, and musicianship and theory. Okay. I also teach uh, songwriting, I've, I teach music psychology, I've been teaching aesthetics recently, which is interesting, oh. um, covering a lot of a lot of different um, grounds and a lot of different interests these days. So I think over time, for better or for worse, um, uh, jazz has become one of many things I do as opposed to the, the sole thing I do, yeah. if you like. Yeah, I think of the sort of roles that you're playing as a as a musician, you you obviously sort of uh, play a lot of session stuff as well um, from time to time, um, and the teaching and and playing in your own band. Is there is there anywhere where you kind of you, you feel you're most you're sort of most fulfilled? What is it you get the most enjoyment out of? <laughs> um, there is, but it's probably not the answer that um, that I should give. I think I get my go most on, be bold. <laughs> I just you might be boring, but I, I get my. I think I get my most fulfillment from teaching. I do. Right. I do um, make judgments after these things. So you know, I'll, I'll finish a gig and think, okay, well, how's this made me feel? Is this something that I want to be doing with my life? Uh, should I? Should I? You know, maybe steer to one of the other directions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I do that after teaching. I do that after giving talks. I do that after yeah. all of these sorts of things. It's a psychology but, in you. Maybe, yeah. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We all just want to be want to be happy, don't we? So I don't want to um, spend my life just doing things I'm doing just because I've started yeah. doing. It. If I work out that actually that's not bringing me much joy, I, I'd, I'd happily stop. <laughs> um, so uh, and I look at the the end of gigs are, are interesting. It's almost like a drug, right? So so at the end of a really good gig, that's like the best feeling ever. But at the end of another gig, it's the worst feeling ever. And I get quite um, anxious and stress before gigs is not much not much fun so it's a, it's a bit of a roller coaster a gig whereas teaching i feel very comfortable doing it i really enjoy it i feel like i'm doing something useful um you know you're, you're um helping other people i guess i feel like i'm good at it which is which is a nice feeling and so i find when i leave a um a class that i've taught in general and i've got you know students coming up to me asking me lots of questions and i'm happy mm. to answer these sorts of things I, I go off feeling great it's like you know i've done something yeah. good I've done it well. Uh, feel proud of this. Um, I think I've helped some people. This this feels like a nice positive thing to have done. So I think actually on balance, in in many ways, I prefer the teaching. That said, I don't think I prefer to just be a teacher. I think it has to be everything in balance. Mm. Uh, I'd feel very um, um, sad if I weren't playing music. I think it's really important to me to be doing that. Again, even on that side, I sometimes think I get more joy from practicing than I do from gigging. Right. Um, so I feel like I love the feeling of improving. I feel like the, 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 I'm having something to work on. I mean, I'm always, I'm always working on music in one way, shape, or form. Even if I'm not at an instrument, I'm thinking in music and trying to work things out. Um, I do lots of stuff with my ears, etc. Um, and I like having like a new thing to work on, a new, um, a new. Um, language to get into all these sorts of things i find that exciting there's a bit of the scientist in me i like the kind of the, the decoding things and mm -hmm. what a strategy for getting somewhere and all of that stuff um and then obviously i like the feeling of this thing having come together and now being this this stage better and all that kind of stuff so i find that um quite fulfilling um uh great gigs feel really great but obviously less less great gigs don't um so the gig part of it is is maybe the um, the less interesting part for me of is that is that the bit that maybe feels more like the work <laughs> job <laughs> uh, not uh, not really actually I sort of got myself out of out of 
um, what do you call it, jobby, jobby musician work a while back. Part of the reason I got into all the teaching was to avoid having to drive up to Manchester to play to 50 drunk wedding guests. <laughs> you want you to play something jazzy, which inevitably isn't jazz. Um, uh, yeah, that that brought me no joy whatsoever, and I got out of that as soon as I as soon as I could. Um, I've actually um, oddly been doing a few more of those sorts of things recently, but I've been very picky over them. I did a, um, a, a like a background trio thing um, not crazily long ago with um, Tristan Mayo and um, Jeremy Brown. That was great because it had a nice piano and it's two great musicians, and it was a, a venue where actually it was quite quiet, so people even went eating their dinner or whatever. Um, and for me, that was okay. I could just ignore that room and just have a nice play with these people. It was almost mm. like having getting some getting some money afterwards. So that seemed like a foolish thing to turn down. But but honestly, some of the the, the function gigs just brought me nothing but nothing but misery. I'm very happy not to be doing most of those anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I I I don't know whether that's or not. I do love gigging, and I think importantly, um, I need to gig because if if I weren't gigging, I think I'd lose the impetus to get better, and that brings me joy. So I, right. need, I need the whole thing in, in balance, really. Um, I don't know if that's an odd outlook or not. Is that an answer you've had before? Is that something you can relate to in any way, every, shape, or form? Every answer is personal, mate. It's, 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 it's all about you, you know, and this is you know, your, your, your story and your journey and what's important to you. Um, so yeah, and I, I, I can completely understand the idea of, uh, you know, teaching, and but I think it's, yeah, you've with you, you've got to you've got to have experience with teaching as well you know that's that's what makes a great teacher is someone who's actually been there done it and is able to pass on stuff that's not just from a you know someone else's textbook writing sort of thing so um yeah, yeah I, 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 have, I have a way of, of seeing this so, so i think of a a good teacher as being a bit like a comedian who's not funny um okay <laughs> So, uh, I mean, I guess you could be funny if you wanted to be, um, but you're um, you're reading a room in a similar kind of way. So you've got like a mixed ability class in front yeah. of you. You've got to tell from what you're saying um, who is really following you, who isn't. And you've got to um, set tasks and plan the remainder of the class in a way that is going to be interesting to this group over here while useful for this group over here. Um, so you've set tasks that can be um, taken at various different levels and... Um, you find ways in which you could spend some one-on-one -on -one time with the people who really do need help and all of these kind of things. Um, so a lot of it is is room reading. Uh, and also um, there's a thing that Steven Pinker calls the curse of knowledge that's always on my mind, which is that you, um, when you know a thing well, you don't realize how unintuitive some of the things you take for granted are. So mm, able yes able to try and take whatever topic it is that you understand very well and try and imagine your I mean it's impossible to do obviously but you but to whatever extent um you can to imagine that you're completely ignorant of this topic what are the mm. things you would need to know then yeah. what thing what some underlying assumptions might I have that that might make me pitch this at a higher level than I should do without realizing those yes. kind of yeah yeah because I I did a bit of training in my IT career and and it was very much that you kind of you forget kind of that you've you've been doing this for the last 10 years and all the bits that you sort of picked up and you have to take it right back it's like can you explain it to a six-year-old you know that's a, that's the kind of yeah. thing yeah, yeah you've got to kind of start at that level um and and i i i i, I enjoyed that process as well because it it's it kind of structures your own thinking as well doesn't it you know you, to, to to sort of be a, you understand it yourself but can you explain it in really simple terms and that's uh, that's, yeah, yeah. that's a real skill right. yeah I think you get better at it um, through that process as well because you, you in in trying to clarify it for others, you you make it clearer for yourself. So yeah, yeah, you do. yeah. I think Jack yeah. is well suited to teaching actually because because so much of what we do is is self teaching anyway. Yeah, um, a lot of it is breaking down um, what seem like mammoth tasks into into small bite sized chunks and approaching them bit by bit and having patience and all of this. I think that. That sets you up quite well to be a teacher, actually. Mm. Yeah. So going back to the gigs, as you mentioned, kind of, you know, you feel great after a great gig, and you feel crap after a not so great gig. What What makes a great gig for you? You know, what's 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 the important? If you had to pick three three things that make a good gig. Sure. Um, 
Well, I mean, do I have to stick to three? You don't have to stick to three, you know. I'll just, uh... <laughs> On a diatribe then, great, perfect, that suits me. Um, so there were personal things. Uh, so I feel like on a personal level, um, I'll have had a good gig if my ears have been working uh, the way I want them to be. Um, the other day I had a, um, a really fun gig with um, Becky Alice at uh, Oliver's where I play horribly often because it's just down the road from my house. Uh, um, that has ups and downs because the piano is invariably out of tune and quite hard to play. Um, but uh, but it's a great place and I love Olivier um, and I have a great time there. But anyway, on this gig on Wednesday, it was it was good. I've been practicing the day um, singing uh, through various um, things using uh, fixed dogs. I just read an article on um, um, uh, Kadai, who's normally seen as a, a, a proponent of removable dough and discovered that he also had like a fixed dough element of his training, which was interesting. Do you know what I mean by fixed dough? Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? I don't know, no, I'm not. <laughs> not I've got a curse of knowledge trap instantly. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, do was in do, re, mi, fa, so, la, la, ti. So, so, right, do, okay, yeah. uh, fixed and movable. Um, in a minute, you're going to have to remind me what the initial question was, because I've just gone off to talking about soul <laughs> I'm leaving you to go. You carry on. <laughs> So, so that's what solfege is. Uh, it comes from uh, Guido of Arez, uh, Arezzo um, initially, although there are lots of different um, systems from around the world, from different cultures, where they have different syllables for each um, each note of um, a scale, whatever that scale may be. So you have this in India as well and various other uh, places. But anyway, this this originated in Italy. Um, uh, it was originally up, re, mi, fa, so, la, and there was no uh, T or C or whatever. Uh, whichever you choose for the final syllable at that point it was just the it's guido's hexachordal system okay. um and uh it came from a gregorian chant where each um different note of the scale um uh, began a different line and those lines started up blah 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 ray blah 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 blah, blah me blah 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 blah, blah, blah. okay so it's right. in lyrics basically to a gregorian chant um i say italian maybe maybe latin i should know this um and uh, yeah, this lots of different systems uh, came out around the world. Uh, France took this on in the Paris Conservatoire system, um, and they started using those syllables for the pitches themselves. So, so art was equivalent to what we call C, Ray was equivalent to what we call D, Me was equivalent to what we call E. Um, but in various other cultures around the world, um, art, Re, Me, Fa, So, uh, etc., ended up at some point being used for just degrees of a scale, regardless of what that scale is. So, so um, uh, art re mi, or what eventually became do re mi, could be the first three notes of an E flat major scale rather than a C major scale. Right. Example. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, in some cultures, they had that, and then in other cultures, it just meant the notes of the scale. So, it's places like uh, if you go to Japan, it's fixed, which means the notes um, um, do re mi means the same thing as C D E. If you go to France, it's fixed. If you go to Italy, it's fixed. If you go to Portugal, it's fixed. Etc. Etc. Anyway, uh, so yeah, that's um, uh, what they have fixed dough in some in some cultures and movable dough in others. And people um, talk about the benefits of each. Um, uh, a lot of people like movable dough because it teaches you the the feeling of different degrees of the scale. Uh, teaches you the kind of different tensions in a musical kind of compositional kind of way. Uh, whereas other people prefer fixed dough because it's more musically realistic. When you're singing syllables uh, which match up to the notes, um, in a sense, you're getting a feel for all the different keys. Yes, but you're getting a feel for all the different keys in relation to a, to a kind of fixed starting point, which is kind of really what's what's going on. Right. Okay. Various things. Anyway, I'd read this article on um, on uh, Kudai, who's famous for um, a movable dough system, um, but it turned out he also incorporated aspects of fixed dough, um, and um, he had a lot of um, score reading on, on his in his method as well and i found that very interesting given that he's famous for movable dough um, right, okay back of this just for fun I, I just decided to spend the day um singing along with everything i was playing but in in fixed dough which i've never done before i don't know whether that helped or not but it meant when i got to the gig i uh my ears were on on fine form 
so from the very beginning of the gig, it was like, okay, you know, I, I feel like I'm comfortable here. I can hear what she's singing. I can hear what he's playing. I, 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 I've, I've got, um, I'm in control. I'm, you know, I know, I, I feel good. Um, so that's something. Just feeling like my musicianship is up yeah. to where I'm That makes me feel good. Um, I like it when I feel like I've been able to tell stories. So where, where it feels like phrase to phrase, I'm actually doing something musical, <laughs> you know, play, um, playing melodies that link with each other and, and, and they have an overall arc and overall narrative. I feel like when I've done that, that feels great. And obviously they, this side of things is very personal, very about me, but yeah. the other side of it is uh, just feeling like you've had a good musical conversation with the others, feeling like um, the energy's been there, feeling like, um, in a non parrot like fashion, that people have been um, responding to each other in a musical way. So, this, you know, people haven't just come there with their agenda. I'm not just going to um, shred over these changes and do yeah. whatever. But actually, you know, the bass player played this thing, and this makes me feel like playing this thing. And now the drummer has heard that, and the drummer starts to play this thing. And then, and then because of this, now I feel like maybe this texture should appear. And um, you never think of quite as academically as that, but that's, that's what's happening. That's what's happening yeah and that feels good when you feel like everyone is really communicating um which has to stress is the opposite of people copying each other which is kind of the death of communication um so i think when all of those things are happening that's great um obviously i, I, I love it when the audience are behind you it helps um although i i sometimes <laughs> in another of my weird things i sometimes find the audience distracting um not if they're um really um engaged and into it that's really brilliant um i certainly find it distracting if they're not engaged and not into it if they're just talking that's <laughs> not, get kind of distracted by over enthusiastic audiences like if if you when you're trying to tell a story when you when you when you're um building melody to melody and you've got all these ideas and you're kind of on this on this mental journey somewhere and you're taking in this information and, and you and you're turning it into this and this text is coming to you and all these kind of things it can it can kill everything dead when someone in the audience like whoops right okay <laughs> someone's loving it and then and it's great that they do it because it's really nice you know it means yeah. they like it. and but 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 for me it's like then i'm suddenly thinking about the last thing i played rather than where i was going it's right. kind of like okay that's interesting yeah yeah journey and now i've like killed it dead and I'm kind of worried about everything that happened beforehand, and I've stopped thinking about what happens ahead. We get um, some no whooping signs up for you on the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, no, no. If people want to whoop, they can whoop. This is. I feel like this is my problem to get over. This is not. <laughs> oh, it's an interesting take, though. Yeah, that's good. Good to hear. So there you go. Um, so those are some of the things that, that 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 make a good gig for me, and I feel like when all of those things come together. That's that's great. So it's definitely a definitely a team effort, but with an element of the personal as well. You know, you like to feel like as part of that team, you've been able to tell some good stories, and your musicianship has been of a level where it's where it's possible for you to do what you want to do. Well, what do you think uh, the the, uh, the gig on Thursday will hopefully be one of those that you leave feeling good about, and uh, <laughs> it'll certainly be a, an appreciative audience. We've got lots of people asking questions about what you'll be playing and that kind of thing, so that's all good. Great. Um, well, I had a good, a good few chats with people in the crowd after Francesco's gig. It was a nice. Um, yeah, nice... yeah, I like I like that atmosphere, and that's what I've really been trying to recreate from from when I was sort of learning in in you know thirty years ago and being able to sort of mix with the band afterwards and chat, and everyone's kind of. Uh, you know, they're not yeah. sort of <laughs> thrown away into a into a dressing room somewhere and you never see them again, sort of them. So yeah. Yeah, it's good. So for, for shits and giggles, are we allowed to ask you what your worst gig was? You know, you talked about you know what makes a good gig, what what makes a bad gig, and is there a, 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 a any any funny anecdotes you've got of a <laughs> a gig that sticks in mind as the one that was it's only difficult because there are so many. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I, I can go. One, I can go like a, 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 a funny way and a dark way. Let's. I maybe I do a bit of both. Um, I had a gig once where I was playing um, solo piano, um, just in the background of a restaurant when I was fresh out of college. This might have been before academy, actually. I can't remember. But when I was pretty young, and a guy sitting next to me just to roast me. Um, so after every tune, whatever I played, he'd say like, "Why would anyone want to listen to that?" Things like this, really dark stuff. 
and I, and I sort of sussed out this guy was the um, was a, um, a pianist. So I was like, okay, well, would you like to play? You know, like I'm presuming this could go one of two ways. Either we get on and be an absolute genius, in which case, okay, fair enough, you know, you yeah. could be nasty. Or we get up and be terrible, in which case you could just be like, sorry, mate, <laughs> fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, that was a dark one. Um, I had some funny ones as well. I had a uh, gig at the um, Nat, uh, Science Museum, Natural History Museum, the one that has the Earth Gallery thing where you go up on an escalator, um, where uh, where I was playing with a band and they had a smoke machine and the smoke machine managed to <laughs> cover just me. Um, <laughs> I can just be hearing keyboard and seeing all these people not in smoke and then this sort of piano sound emanating from smoke. Um pretty funny. Um Not in your eyes style. <laughs> Tonight, Matthew. <laughs> uh yeah. So that was that was one of the worst ones for a funny reason. I mean I've yeah, I've done done all sorts. Fantastic. Well, uh, like I say, I'm sure that uh, Thursday's gig is going to be one of the uh, one of the good ones. And uh, I'm, I'm glad <laughs> the last last time you was up, obviously, wasn't we didn't scare you off. So it's good that you're, uh, you're coming back. I'm really looking forward to uh, having Looking Glass come play for us. So that's uh, Thursday, the 18th of April, uh, this coming Thursday at the Mars Bar in Worcester. So thanks very much for your time today, uh, Sam. It's been great chatting with you. Happy. I'm looking forward to the gig.